My castaway this week is a one-man history of the British musical over the last 20 years. Cats, Les Miserables, Miss Saigon, Phantom of the Opera, they're all his productions. Stage struck from the age of seven when he first saw the musical Salad Days, he put on his first show when he was 23. It left him £40,000 in debt. He's learned a thing or two since then. These days his shows not only pack him in in the West End, but in Buenos Aires, Hong Kong and Broadway too. Success has brought both wealth and content. I've done it, he says. I recognise how lucky I am. I have no urge, no need to do it again. He is Sir Cameron Mackintosh. If you weren't quite so successful, I suppose, Cameron, one would say that was complacent. I can't really think the fire has gone out of your belly for the musical, has it? Oh, far from it. In fact, I'm busier now than uh, I have been for ages. I'm just having to put on my shows all the way around the world. Now, I mean, I've always known that I was lucky. I mean, I, I thought it was quite normal for a ten-year-old to know exactly what they were going to do when they grew up. By the time I was in my mid-twenties, I realised that very few people knew what they wanted to do. Do. And luckily, uh, I was able to do it all my life and have been and haven't had to grow up completely on the way. Absolutely. And <laughs> yeah. had these huge numbers of hits. So yeah. now you're 55. I mean, what are you saying that you, you don't want to do another new musical? It, that's all I'm doing. I'm not doing any new musicals for the mm. foreseeable future. But I can't believe, you know, if, if the Andrew Lloyd Webber of the 21st century walked through the door with a score and a, and a good story that you wouldn't... Want it? My personal belief is that actually what the Andrew Lloyd Webber of the 21st century should do is find the Cameron Mackintosh of the 21st century. But let me, let me really test this. What if somebody walks through the door and says, OK, there's been a lot of wrangling over this for years now, but you can have Mary Poppins? Well, I've got Mary Poppins. I um, it sits in the drawer. You can't do it. That's I, what I'm I, saying. Well, All the problems yes, fell away. But it's got to be a meeting of the minds between Disney, who own this wonderful film, and the P.L. Travers estate, who P.L. Travers didn't particularly like the film, and she wanted something nearer the books. And my belief has always been that between the two, there is a wonderful, magical new musical to do. And you to would be done. do that. That's exactly I my point. I absolutely would do it. it. Of course I would.
Come on, tell me your first record on this desert island. Salad Days. Oh, well, what would have happened to my life if Salad Days hadn't been written? I don't know. It was extraordinary that, you know, that that show, which I didn't really want to go and see when I was first dragged by my aunt at the age of seven, and I was so captivated by the story of a magic piano that made all London dance that I wanted to go back on my eighth birthday, which I did. And my mother came with me, and at the end of the show, I marched down the aisle because I discovered that the composer, Julian Slade, was sitting in the pit, and I introduced myself, and he took, rather (laughs) taken aback, but was very nice, instead of just brushing me off with an autograph, took me backstage onto the stage and showed me how the actors mind on Minnie the Magic Piano all the songs that he actually played in the pit. And he showed me how the flying saucer came in on wires and how the fences moved across the stage and where the scenery was kept. And I went, hmm, yes, this is what I'll do when I grow up. Back to that time, you were putting on plays at home, weren't you? Everybody knew that's what you wanted yes. to do. What's, uh, you were writing and performing at home, weren't you? I was uh, writing bismally awful plays for the puppets that my brothers Robert and Nicky were cajoled into working with me. But we all got on like a house on fire. But were you playing anything? Can you no, play no I can't play. Right? My brother Robert is brilliant, but me, I can barely hum along. I'm the kind that gets nudged in church. So you never really wanted to perform. You never wanted to compose. You never wanted to... You always did just want I, to be the I just producer. wanted to be a producer. And in fact, the only time I did perform was in Lana Bart's Oliver. It was my second job as an assistant stage manager on the national touring company back in, I think, 65 it was. And it turned out that one of the two ASMs had to be on stage and move things around and join in the chorus numbers. And I was slightly less tone deaf than the other ASM, so I got the job. And I had a whale of a time overacting terribly and realising that, indeed, being a producer was a much better idea for me than being an actor. Because, essentially, of course, being a producer is being very bossy, yes? Would you confess to this? Um, I don't know. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wonderful spoof that uh, that Andrew Lloyd Webber and Stephen Sondheim did uh, of Send in the Clowns about you, was it, which always began, isn't he, Richard? <laughs> and halfway through it goes, always interfering. You know, I, that, that's exactly true, what, your, what your reputation yes, is. Yes, it's it? why I think I like cooking, you see, because it's the same thing. You get all the ingredients and it's the way you put them together. But the important thing is not to buy pedigree dogs and bark yourself because, I mean, I've always worked with the best talents. I've been very lucky. And you've got to get the best out of them. I always believe that the authors are the ones that have the inspiration. They're inspired. And then you have to make sure that they are inspired even more to make the work even better. Suggestions, 
suddenly appearing, forever interfering. But, but here we are and cheering as we might. The man who flops the music of tonight. Isn't it kitsch? Sometimes it's crass. That's when he says to himself, bring in the class. Send him the crowns. Tea! Get me the crowns. Always in charge. He's the sketches, signs them. Making things wise. He redesigns them. How generous he's been to underwrite. The overwritten music calls tonight. God, but he's rich. Richer than me. Lucky he never grew up. Or where would we be? Thank you, Sir C. Let's do this again. You're out of your mind. Well, maybe next year. Echo number two. Ah, well, my wonderful dad, who was known in the family as Ian Macintosh and known in the profession and most of the bars in the West End of London as Spike Macintosh, and he was a marvellous jazz trumpeter. In fact, Louis Armstrong gave him one of his trumpets because he did. He was the nearest sounding to Louis of the sort of white, black jazzers of the 40s and 50s in England. He, of course, was at the same time trying to run the family business, the timber business, and he realised that it wasn't possible to carry these two completely polarised careers going on. And so re he reluctantly gave up playing the trumpet, except at the weekends. And so... I think because he gave up what he loved the best is why he encouraged Robert, Nicky and I to do anything that we wanted and we never had a problem in the family about going into show business. Time played by my castaway's father, Spike McIntosh, and his all stars. So, your father, Cameron, was a, a wild jazzman he, at heart, and he was Scottish. I mean, one can see 
all of his input <clears throat> into you. What about your mother? What well, does she have? My mother is the other half, and I think the other reason that I've always been very practical in my life. My mother come, was from Malta, and she's Italian and Spanish and a little French, and she was she survived incredibly. And it's quite difficult to get the stories out of her because she was there during the, the incredible bombing for two years of Malta, and survived the most incredible hardships with her family as the Blitzkrieg happened, and it's where she learned to cook out of any scraps and I always make the terrible joke about she used to make ratatouille out of real rats in order to feed the family and of course she used to she didn't say she quite ate rats but they certainly ate cats out there Mm -hmm. it was the only way to survive and she always used to make the family budget stretched far beyond any realms of possibility the colorful island of Malta which in other times was a happy hunting ground for holiday cruises and ocean-going liners is now gallantly living up to Disraeli's description, the little military hothouse. Her streets now echo to the terrific gunfire put up by the anti-aircraft defences and the scream and crash of bombs as Italian and German aircraft attack the mighty atom of the Mediterranean. Headquarters of the British Mediterranean fleet, Malta is a powerful stronghold and is giving a magnificent account of herself. Up to the present, the British dependency has stoutly withstood well over 500 air raids. From their shelters, many hewn out of solid rock, the heroic Maltese emerged to survey the wreckage of their houses and buildings. This is culture according to the Beast of Berlin and the Jackal of Rome. The 95 square mile island fortress has suffered much, but she can take it. And by heaven, she can hit back. So she's the practical one, as you said. And it seems to me that, because I know you went off to the Central School of Speech and Drama, didn't you, that that the reason you didn't like and you didn't last very long there is that there was nothing practical about it. It was a bit, it was sort of more Sophocles than Binky Beaumont. It it was. I mean, you know, I was on a stage management course and I wanted to learn about the theatre because I'd only been an amateur at that point and I wanted to get some professional experience. But after the year and I worked out how to run a run a show backstage the idea of worrying about what Euripides thought just didn't cross my mind so I want, actually wanted to get into the West End which is why I just tramped the streets until I got a stagehand job at Drury Lane. Well, um, yes, and yeah. then, as you say, you went uh, out with Oliver on tour, I think, and was in, right. in the chorus as well. Did you really think, I suppose one does really when one's that young and innocent, that it was just a straightforward line? All you had to do was get a bit of experience and, I mean, you could have a kind of game plan that in three and a half years you'd be putting yeah, on show, you'd be a producer. It, it, I'm afraid it's as arrogant as that. I, I actually thought it, I'd do it in five years and I managed to do it in about two and a half or three <laughs> A man's got a heart, hasn't he? Joking apart, hasn't he? And though I'd be the first one to say that I wasn't a saint I'm finding it hard to be really as black as they paint I'm reviewing the situation Can a fella be a villain all his life? All the trials and tribulation Better settle down and get myself a wife And the wife would cook and sew for me And come for me and go for me And go for me and nag at me The finger she would wag at me The money she will take from me A misery she'll make from me I think I'd better think it out again Record number three. Record number three. It's Elgar, Cocaine Overture in London town. I love Elgar. I just think his music is one one of the great British composers. It's full of theatre. It's full of great melody. It's full of exciting bombast. In fact, it's like one of my shows, and I'm sure if I was around in that time, I'd have tried to get him to write a few. (laughs)
part of Elgar's Cocaine Overture in London Town, played by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Sir Thomas Beecham. Um, I said, Cameron, that you had this £40,000 disaster with Anything Goes when you were 23, but apparently you had some before that anyway. <laughs> Yes, I'd managed not to lose £40,000 before that. In fact, my first show was the ironically named Reluctant Debutante because I wasn't, which I did at Henley on Thames with a couple of other producers in 1967. So you're 21 then? Yes, I was 21. But anything goes, burnt your fingers. A lot. Uh, then, then, so you sort but of. It taught me a very good lesson too. Mm. 16 great Cole Porter songs and a ropey book don't make a great musical. The book is the key to what makes the musical theatre work. The narrative, the big the story. The, the story of it. But then you have shows like Crazy For You and 42nd Street, which are these kind of Yes, but they're, re they're retro shows. They're not actually the cornerstones of what make the musical theatre go. I mean, musical people generally regard Showboat back in 1927 as the first great musical play. One of the reasons Rodgers and Hammerstein are done again and again and again is that they're always, the, the best ones are always based on wonderful, dramatic stories mm, people, and good stories. People have got to want to know what yeah. happens next. And all the shows that I've enjoyed doing most have come from really strong material, Dickens, Hugo, mm. T.S. Eliot. Very rarely do I do a show which doesn't have a classic base. But one of those early ones was Side by Side by Sondheim, which confounds everything you've just been saying about narrative, because that was actually a retrospective of Sondheim uh, tune songs. No, no, you have it? missed the point of why it works. Right. The reason Side by Side works so well, and I discovered this in retrospect, is that each of those brilliant Sondheim songs are a little play in themselves. They're not just a pile of tunes from shows that are thrown together in a, in a, in a nice order. The reason it was such a success with the general public, in fact, the first Sondheim general public success in, in England, was that people got into the characters of the songs that uh, Sondheim had written without being overburdened by rather heavy books. The interesting thing about that, of course, is that it's total luck because you bought it sight unseen, didn't you? It's probably the cleverest thing I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about record number 14, because this is Sondheim. Another show I did with Stephen was, of course, putting it together. We didn't do anything f with it for t two or three years, and then we decided to do it off-Broadway. We had a marvellous day just dreaming of who we'd love to be in it. And I can't remember which one of us said, oh, Julie Andrews would be fantastic. And I said, well, why don't I ask her? And I asked her, and I asked her, and I asked her. And thank God she said yes. <laughs> Listen, everybody, look, I don't know what you're waiting for. A wedding? What's a wedding? It's a prehistoric ritual where everybody promises fidelity forever, which is maybe the most horrifying word I ever heard, and which is followed by a honeymoon where suddenly you realise he's saddled with a nut and want to kill me, which he should. Thanks a bunch, but I'm not getting married. Go have lunch, because I'm not getting married. You've been grand, but I'm not getting married. Don't just stand there, I'm not getting married. And don't tell Paul that I'm not getting married today. Go, can't you go? Why is nobody listening? Goodbye, go and cry at another person's wake. If you're quick for a kick, you could pick up a crack. 
christening. But please, on my knees, there's a human life at stake. Listen, everybody, I'm afraid you didn't hear, or do you want to see a crazy lady fall apart in front of you? It isn't only Paul who could be ruining his life, you know. Well, both of us be losing our identities. I telephoned my analyst about it, and he said to call him Monday, but by Monday I'll be floating in the Hudson with the other garbage. I'm not well. I'm not getting married. You've been swell, but I'm not getting married. Clear the hall, because I'm not getting married. Thank you all, but I'm not getting married. And don't tell Paul, but I'm not getting married today. Bless this bride, totally insane, slipping down the drain. And bless this day in our hearts as it starts to rain. Today. Look, you know I adore you all, but why watch me die like Eliza on the ice? Look, perhaps I'll collapse in the abs right before you all. So take back the cake, burn the shoes and boil the rice. Look, I didn't want to have to tell you, but I may be coming down with hepatitis and I think I'm going to faint. So if you want to see me faint, I'll do it happily. But wouldn't it be funnier to go and watch your funeral? So thank you for the 27 dinner plates and 37 butter knives and 47 paperweights and 57 candle holders. One more thing, I'm not getting married. As I've said, I'm not getting married. Snap your ring, I'm not getting married. Gwen is dead, I'm not getting married. Pray away, but I'm not getting married. Terrific, isn't it? Julie Andrews, solo version of Sometimes Getting Married Today, performed for for the Broadway premiere of Putting It Together. That, of course, was uh, 1993. Thirteen years it was before that, that the big one happened for you, which was Cats, and that was the one that was going to make you a millionaire. And uh, I presume you need never have worked again after that, really. Well... What Cats first did was pay off all the debts that I'd tried to keep away from the bank manager for the previous 20 years. But not only did it pay off my debts, but it gave me my creative independence. That was the thing I realised it was the best. From that point on, I didn't have to have another show in order to keep the turnover going. Mm. I could actually just do the shows I wanted. And that is a privilege which very few people are blessed with. It's completely liberating, obviously. That show, of course, has been seen all over the world. I don't know how many people must have seen it by now, but 50 million more. Millions and millions of people who I love. Grossed (laughs) 2 billion, I gather. So I'm told. More by now. Anyway, that and all of the others, Phantom, Miss Saigon, are seen all over the world. Now, 
they're kind of franchised in a sense, aren't they? But are they the same when they're seen in other parts of the world? No, it depends on the show. The only show of, of the great four, as it were, that has not yet been seen in a different version is Phantom of the Opera. Cats, from a very early age, where it was appropriate, was done in different versions. I mean, I remember we went to see one in Hungary where it was done set in the loft of, a, of an old opera house. And somewhere there's a Miss Saigon that plays with a real helicopter, isn't it? Again, that was Budapest. Budapest is the <laughs> forefront of musical theatre. Terrifying. Yes, they did it in a stadium of about eight or 9,000 people. And they, they had this fantastic cast, a huge orchestra, and it was completely different. And I remember I was in the south of France at the time and I said, look, I've, it's a bit of a tight connection to get there from, on the only plane I can get. And they said, well, don't worry, we'll send a helicopter for you. And I said, oh, that's very, very kind. And yes, they said, we've got one in the show. And I said, no, no, the one in the show doesn't actually fly. Uh, They said, this one does. And I remember myself and my assistant Jenny got into this flying petrol tank on, on the Budapest airport and flew the 45 minutes to this place. And then we came over this amazing old medieval town with this huge cathedral where the stage was put in the front and we went oh that's lovely isn't that lovely and then I, we saw this postage stamp down the side of this cliff like cathedral and we landed in it and when the helicopter took off it was literally 18 inches either side of the blade as the actors climbed into it and it then hovered over the audience I can tell you I had several changes of pants when I got home <laughs> shows, your shows, which is what you're now doing as you say, are put on all around the world. How do you maintain quality control? Well, if if the shows are reproductions of my original London shows, then I have my own teams of people to do it. But over half the productions, or maybe two thirds of the productions of Les Miserables are done in a completely different way. I mean, I want the best equivalent of the local directors and designers, the Trevor Nunns and the John Napiers to do it. And they will then send me the designs and I will look at them and if I feel that they have the right sensibility, i.e. as different to ours, but at the same time they capture the show and reinvent it, which is what excites me, then I say, go ahead with it. And I approve only by videos and listening to recordings the key principal casting of all the shows around the world. Tell me about your next record, number five. Les Miserables, I mean, an extraordinary show for me. This was a show brought to me by a Hungarian director with the original French concept album that they had done back in 1980. And he said to me, if anyone is mad enough to have done T.S. Eliot's poems for cats, might take on Les Miserables. Oh, 
It's very interesting, isn't it, that it was panned by the critics in the beginning? Yes, it wasn't completely panned. I mean, the, it was the initial reviews, the, the overnight reviews. And I remember I assembled for my usual post opening lunch and we were all extremely gloomy because the night before you had seen the most extraordinary happening in a theatre. I mean, people were completely coming out on air and you couldn't reconcile the two things that one was reading in the paper. And I thought, well, I'll get the worst of it out of the way. And I rang the box office just before lunch and they said to me, God, how did you finally get through? I said, well, I did make a few attempts. And they said, this has been the busiest morning in the history of the Barbican. We'd sold 5,000 tickets before. Exactly. And that's what's interesting, isn't it? That, it? that if something's good enough, it will triumph over the critics. Not often. It sometimes doesn't in its own time. I mean, people forget that Porgy and Bess failed when it first went on Broadway. West Side Story got good but respectful reviews. It only ran 15 months and was thought too avant-garde at that time but for what, a general public. What about Martin Guerre, which um, f- flopped, really? I mean, a yep. tougher word, flopped. And it's, it's, it's amazing because it was out of the same stable. There's Les Miserables, Miss Saigon, it was Boubil and Schoenberg and so on. It should have been a huge success. Yes, I've got a feeling se- well, there were several things that didn't work for that at the time. One is, I think, that kind of musical was already... We'd had too many of them. What is that kind of musical? An operatic sung through dramatic musical. I think it had been more than ten years since we'd started out with the musicals of the 80s and of Les Miserables at that point. And also the idea of the show, which I still think is a, a wonderful idea was very difficult. It's a, it's a show about deceit, the whole story, and it's a true story, which is again unusual mm. for, a, for a musical. It's about you, deceit. And, and did it, you spot it coming? Did you, as you no, watched the we, rehearsals, we, you, did you, you never think, do. Uh, you know, you, I knew it was having difficulty coalescing, absolutely. And the reason we kept on with it was because I wanted to give them the opportunity to write the show that they wanted to write. All the insults and the names, the kicks, the tricks, the vicious games to make a young man reach his prime. They say he's weak, they say he's snapped, a man who's scared, a man who's trapped, when all a young man needs is time. Let them try, with the thrill of the pack, hold your breath, till the day he comes back. No 
war. I don't give a damn why stay what for. I know who I am, a man above the lie that they live. A man who love when he's ready to give. But I'll come back one day, after ten years away. And they'll stop and they'll say, look, look. Look, it's Martin Gare. We need him here, no need to fear, never despair. Yes, it's Martin Gare. Back home at last, those from the past better beware. Stride through the town, laughs, who waves them our way. They are, think he must be the same. But by heaven, they're sure to see this mortal Martin Gare. That a name That bastard Pierre Holds my life in his hand He's no uncle of mine He can have all my land The land he sold me for May God decide he goes to hell And all of Artigat as well It's Martin Gare, standing so brave, back from the grave, who else would dare? Yes, that's Martin Gare, back from the war, not like before, on this I swear. He's seen it all, he's travelled the land, and look, look at what he became. Why heaven they're sure to see this mortal Martin Gare, just look. Look at what he became If I haven't the shot to see this mob to Martin Gare That I But I think it was a it was an interesting point of view from the public's point of view. Up until Martin Gare, they assumed that these big hits came down the pike like a sausage machine. And they don't. And I think the one good thing about Martin Gare for the whole industry was to show that actually that is not the norm. What is abnormal is to have hits like Cats, Les Miserables, Saigon and Phantom. positive thinking. No, it's true. You're a bottle half full, Um, man. But look at the moment. At the moment, what the theatre is going through everywhere is recycled old material. Mm. Great revivals. I am responsible for some of them. But even the new musicals, like wonderful Mamma Mia!, are based on material written 25 years ago. I want to, ask you, I want to ask you about that. Let's just pause for your, your sixth record, and I want to talk about that. It's very interesting. Well, my sixth record is the marvellous Royal National Theatre production by Trevor Nunn and Susan Stroman of Rogers and Hammerstein's Great Oklahoma. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. The corn is as high as a elephant's eye And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky Oh, what a beautiful morning Oh, what a beautiful day I got a beautiful feeling It's going my way All the cattle are standing like statues All the cattle are standing like statues They don't turn their heads as they see me ride by But a little brown maverick is winking her singing to you. All the sounds of the earth are like music. All the sounds of the earth are like music. The breeze is so busy it don't miss a tree. And an old weep 
even Willard is laughing at me. Hugh Jackman as Curly singing Oh What a Beautiful Morning in the National Theatre production of Oklahoma. So Cameron, tell me, is it then dull of us, we the public, I mean, the musical theatre-going public, to only want regurgitations, revivals, Oklahoma, My Fair Lady? Why don't we want anything fresh and new and different? I don't think it's dull. I think it's something that we go through. I think it's a cycle that theatre has gone through on a regular basis. I mean, in the 20s, there was a whole period of going back to see the old operettas. Then you got the sort of bright young thing of the 30s and the crash came. And then there was another area of seeing old shows. And then you went into a new period with Oklahoma. And at the end of the golden era of the American musical, which is thought to be 1965 with Fiddler on the Roof, then other than the odd success, an oddball show like Chorus Line, it didn't really get him to gear until the end of the 70s with when Andrew. And, well, with Andrew and Tim first with, with Evita. Evita mm. And then shortly followed us by Andrew and myself and everyone else in so, the 80s. So, what do you say now that, that we're in another dip? As I it think were, so. I think for the last two or three years, we're at the end of a creative cycle where people in their 30s going for it over the next 20 years. And a creative cycle of being innovative is usually 15 to 20 years. It doesn't mean that any of us have lost our marbles or can't do it. It means that another wave of people are going to come forward. You don't it, think it's got anything to do with the fact that, I mean, we all know about the international situation, I mean, that somehow we have just lost that desire to be expansive and be liberal. You know, we're hunkering down. I think, we want yes, something but more I think that's, that is nothing to do with the current situation. It's, it's to do with possibly the end of the 20th century. If you look back at the history of the end of the first millennium, there was a great change went on and people go, well, yes, they are excited about going forward, but they don't want to lose what they've got. So I think all of these shows, which have been in production for four or five years, you know, um, they've all come together and shows are often a catalyst for the time. I remember saying to Alan Babiel and Klomisha Schoenberg in 1985 that how extraordinary it was that Les Miserables in the theatre and Platoon in the cinema about the Vietnam War when Vietnam War films were a taboo were both the popular hits of that year and both of them had been drafted in Paris I think in 1978 they'd both been written there and why from a time that it was written that they both landed in the world in the same year it's funny I think artists are catalysts for what's in the air
musical number seven. The musical Oliver has been part of my life <laughs> since I first queued at the wonderful price, I think it was Sixpence Gallery or something like that, at the, at the new theatre in London in St Martin's Lane, and I saw Lionel Bart's extraordinary musical. And recently I put together a, an amazing team to do a great revival. The, the, the best thing about that production of Oliver was that it brought Lionel Bart back after a number of years where he'd basically drunk away uh, most of his inheritance and had been forgotten for being a genius. And what I loved about him all through those years, because I did know him a bit, was he was never bitter. And he was a great person to know. And his music will go on forever. What is your favourite song in Oliver? Well, it's tough. I mean, the first song I ever wrote for Oliver was uh, The Kid's Prayer. It's, I wrote it in the car. It's called Where Is Love. Yeah. But uh, that, is the, that is the root song of the whole score. All the other songs really belong on it. Mm. But one of the songs I kind of like, because it's helped me out of uh, trouble when I've not been feeling so hot, yeah. is a song called Who Will Buy. Yeah. I'm going to sing you the song Who Will Buy. It's a croak, but I'll have a go. Oh, I like croakers. Yeah. Right, All Dave, right. a little tinkle there would be in order. We'll buy this wonderful morning Such a sky you never did see Who will tie it up with a ribbon And put it in a box for me so I could see it at my leisure Whenever things go wrong And I would keep it as a treasure To last my whole life long Who will buy this wonderful feeling I'm so high I swear I could fly Me oh my I don't want to lose it So what am I to do To keep the sky so blue There must be someone Who will bow You see, Oliver, in this life, one thing counts in the bank, large amounts. I'm afraid these don't grow on trees. You've got a bigger pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Boys, you've got to pick a pocket or two. Large amounts don't grow on trees. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Let's show Oliver how it's done, shall we, my dear? Why should we break our backs stupidly paying tax? Better get some untaxed income. Better pick a pocket or two. You gotta pick a pocket or two, boys. You've gotta pick a pocket or two. doesn't pay. Robin Hood, what a crook, gave away what he took. Charity's fine, subscribe to mine. Get out and pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Tip from Bill Sykes, he can whip what he likes. I recall he started small, he had to pick a pocket or two. You got to pick a pocket or two, boys. <laughs> got to pick a pocket or two! We can be like old Bill Sykes, if you pick a pocket or two. Stop, 
Jonathan Bryce as Fagin singing You've Got to Pick a Pocket or Two from Lionel Bart's Oliver. There's only one thing, it seems to me, going for Cameron Mackintosh on a desert island, and that is that he can cook. How good are you? I'm pretty good. Are you? But I'm erratic. You not cut something out I, of nothing. I, yes. That's the point. I, mean, I can. I, you know, when I, when I was a stagehand at Drury Lane, I used to earn £7 as a cleaner in the morning and £7 in the evening on, on the stage. And I used to be able to walk backwards and forwards to Half Moon Street, where I used to... In those days, you could actually buy things in Shepherd's Market that you could eat on. And there was butchers and fishmongers and things like that. And I used to manage to live on £1.50 and two belling co- rings, cooking rings, in, in my <laughs> flat next door. So you're all right um, with a clam and a bit of seaweed? And I can, coconut. more or less, you just throw me down and I will be able to, I'll be able to cook Ready, something. Ready, steady camera. Going, <laughs> um, but otherwise, it's the final curtain for you, isn't it? Because low boredom threshold, I mean, you're just going to go yes. out of your mind. Uh, well, except that I, you know, I've had this wonderful place I've been going all my life in Scotland, which is like a desert island. It's actually not an island, but it is, it is beautiful. I love the solitude. I mean, I'm not sure how long I'd like the solitude for or how quickly I would be able to get all the animals into a show. But there was a point when I was on a holiday in Antarctica about nine years ago when as they clocked me in and they went, oh, yes, well, I hope you have a nice time. And I went, what's the entertainment like on it? And they said, well, we don't really have it because we don't have entertainers on this show. And I said, don't you ever do a cruise show? And they said, well, we do that, but we won't with you on board. And I went, oh, yes, you will. I'm going to help you. And I put on this show called Ice and I (laughs) re-choreographed the whole of one singular sensation from Chorus Line with the entire crew, other than the captain, dressed as penguins, which I'd studied during my 10 days out there. And, uh, but you've got is... no cast on this island. I mean, you've got no, nothing. But, oh, but I'll, I'll work at something. My dog is already ready to go into show business, and I will find something. I will find some animals there. Tell me about your last record. Well, my last record is written by one of the great composers that Britain's ever had, which is Andrew Lloyd Webber. And the reason I've chosen the Pierre Yezu is that I so remember the day we were sitting around his kitchen at home and instead of blasting me away with his super stereo, he'd just written this requiem for his father who died. He wanted to write this in memory of his father, Bill. And instead of playing it to me on his great big machine, he had this really cheap old cassette recorder. And he said, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. I, I, I really like this. And Sarah's just put a dummy track on it. And this was the early demo version of it. And I sat there and the music just blew me away and it made me cry. And it always will.
Sarah Brightman singing the P.A. Jesu from Andrew Lloyd Webber's Requiem with Paul Miles Kingston and the Winchester Cathedral Choir. Now, if you could only take one of those eight, then, Cameron, which one would you take? I'd take P.A. Jesu. Mm. What about your book? My book? I would take Delia. Delia Smith? <laughs> yes. Would you? Yes. The reason is everything is in Delia. <laughs> How to boil and, an egg is in Delia. Yes, absolutely. There's not one thing that you can't go into the book to find. And as n none of my recipes ever come out the same, it's great to have one reference book where I can go, now, how would I start that? And I half read it and I think, oh, well, I know I can improve on that and I will go on and do something else with it. But there's no other cookbook that actually has such a complete range of stuff. They have some wonderful other things to copy, but I never like copying. Yeah. I like improving. And what about your luxury? Well, that is completely selfish. It's a, it would be a solar-powered magic mix because therefore it comes from the sun <laughs> and <laughs> will help me <laughs> get through some of my recipes and make new different things whilst I'm rehearsing my penguins. Sir Cameron Macintosh, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you.